August 17th, 2009, in Bray, County Wicklow. Two are dead, two more injured. The person responsible would be called, quote, the most unsuspecting culprit. Shane Clancy grew up in a working class uh, area called Ballybrack, which was a suburb in the south side of Dublin. His parents, Leonie Fennell and Patrick Clancy, would have three sons. However, when the boys were still young, they divorced. Leonie, a hairdresser, went on to marry uh, Tony and they had four more children. So Shane was one of seven. His mother, and Tony decided to move from Dublin out to a small town called Red Cross in Wicklow. However, when Shane was 17, he decided he wanted to move back closer to the city centre in Dublin. And so he rented a bedsit in uh, Dalky, which would be a quite small affluent area in South Dublin. He managed to get a job as a barman in the club, which was a pub just across from his bedsit. He was said to be um, quiet, but a uh, hard worker and reliable. And because he lived so close, he was actually able to cover a lot of last minute shifts. So with his wages, he was able to pay his rent and uh, have a car. To me, it seems 17 is quite young to, to move out. Um, and it is said, you know, it's said that he got on very well with his family, even his, you know, his stepfather and stuff. So I don't think they were kind of reasons for him moving out. I think he just wanted to live closer to Dublin, which is fair enough, because as a child, he grew up there. I get that. Um, but then I wonder why he didn't go to live with his dad. His dad lived in nearby Dunleary. Anyway, not really relevant to the story. I'm just, I just think it's um, a bit young. Uh, it is said that he was quite mature for his age and, you know, so maybe it was fine. Shane was quite bright and he done really well in his leaving cert. And he went on to Trinity College to study Irish and theology. He could speak fluent Irish and he uh, got a, got involved in a lot of like activities and societies in the college. Shane adored his younger siblings and would go home on weekends to you know take them out so to the beach or out for food and stuff like that. Uh, he was said to be a joker and very kind and compassionate. He was extremely charitable. He raised a lot of money for different um, charities. It is said that he would you know give away his bus fare you know to a homeless person um and then just walk you know the whatever amount of miles it was back to Dalkey from the city centre. At his 21st he actually you know told people um that were coming that instead of getting him gifts or giving him money that he would um he had buckets there for them to donate money to St Vincent de Paul. Shane didn't drink um apparently he just didn't like the taste of it and uh but he would you know that didn't stop him going out and he would be he would go on all the college nights out and and be one of the last standing at the start of 2006 so two years after he had moved to Dalkey, um shane was introduced to jennifer hannigan by a mutual friend jennifer was from a nearby area called kalini he had gone to one of the private schools where she done really well and she had gone on to study in dunleary's the Institute of Art, Design and Technology. Shane, who was, you know, tall and handsome, uh, was now 19 and he asked the 18 year old Jennifer out and she couldn't help but say yes. The two started going out and were said to be mad about each other. Shane actually got Jen a job in uh, the club, in the pub as a lounge girl. Um, she was quite chatty, so she got on well with the customers and the staff. In August 2007, they actually split for about six weeks, but then they got back together and they were just as into each other as before. One source says that the couple even discussed marriage and, you know, building a home. But as time went on, and, you know, as it does, people grow, people change, and the differences in them started to become uh, more clear. Jennifer seemed to be, you know, very social and, and, you know, still wanted to kind of, you know, just find her way in life, you know, figure out what she wanted, that type of thing. Whereas it seemed like Shane was the type of person who knew what he wanted, had a, you know, had a plan in, in mind. And what he wanted was a life with Jennifer. Jennifer was very, very close to her, you know, college friends. Like it was a real arty group, I suppose. Um, and so they would go out a lot. And it seemed that she was quite close to uh, one of the lads called Sebastian Crean. And Shane didn't really like this because they, you know, they'd, they'd hang out a lot. Apparently they'd get taxis home, you know, back from city centre and stuff like that. So he didn't like this and he was quite jealous. And he seemed to think that Sebastian was trying to steal Jennifer away. At the end of 2008, uh, Shane lost his job in the bar. And it is said to be because he had just, you know, his attitude had just become too moody. And by the start of 2009, 
uh, Shane and Jennifer's relationship had, had essentially started to fizzle out. Then, on the 13th of March, Shane suddenly suggested that they end things. Jennifer seemed to be relieved and so she, she agreed to this. Now, it is said that they had decided that they would, you know, take time apart and reassess things and then come back together in September and, see, you know, see see how the situation was. It is also said that Shane basically done this to, you know, to kind of like shock Jennifer, I think, you know, into realising like what she wanted and that it was a relationship. But obviously that wasn't what she wanted anymore. So he immediately regretted it because he was so surprised that she was willing to just give up the relationship. But Jennifer, you know, apparently was happy now being single and being able to, you know, just go out on nights out and not have to kind of tell someone where she was and what she was doing. And she seemed to like the freedom of it. Shane started to show up in places that he knew Jennifer would be and asking her to get back to, back with him. Uh, but Jennifer was adamant that, you know, what they had was now over. She had hoped that they were going to be able to stay friends, but this just seemed to be proving to be difficult and things were just going to get worse. Seb. Jennifer and her friend Sebastian who went by Seb uh, got closer and by the start of May they started seeing each other. Now one could speculate whether they had actually been starting to see each other before that, had the attraction been there before that and maybe that's why things started fizzling out with Shane. You don't, I don't know, we don't know. Understandably they didn't want everyone else in their circle to know that they were dating you know it can make things awkward uh, so they kept it they kept it on the down low Seb was a musician and a photographer uh, it was said that he was very easy going that you know the two of them were quite it was very much just let's see where this is gonna go what's gonna happen this type of thing very very lax by the end of May the friends uh, found out about Jennifer and Sebastian and Jennifer knew that she needed to tell Shane that she was now seeing someone else before someone else told him. So the next day she told him and from what I read I have to assume that she actually met with him because she says that he from that from then on he just changed everything about him changed she said even just the way he walked the way he presented himself he just changed she just like seemed to just give up feel sorry for himself. Now a few days after this uh, Jennifer was due to fly to Thailand for a trip with the girls and it was around the same time that Shane was actually supposed to be going on like a charity trip to uh, Calcutta in India with Suis, one of the charities that he worked really well with. From when she told him until she was leaving a couple of days later he bombarded her with calls and texts trying to just you know just try to show that tell her like he loves her and that he, he wants to be with her and that you know asking her back. On the 3rd of June the day before she was due to fly out, Shane arrived um, with presents for her, for her birthday. And she explained, you know, like that she couldn't take them and she just asked him to like leave her alone. Uh, Shane apparently then just went out and sat in his car outside her house. When she went out and asked him to leave, he got really annoyed and he like sped off. And apparently, she, you know, she was worried that he would crash or something. So she rang him and it turns out he just drove around the corner. And so they ended up talking for ages and ages. It is said then that a family member had to stay with him that night because he was so upset. Now I'm just going to interject here. He is still quite young. We all like to think we're old at that age, but we're not. And, you know, you could say, oh, it's only a breakup, whatever. But he is, he's, he's young and he's upset and he's heartbroken. We've all been there. I don't know why at this point his, his mother wasn't like, you know, why don't you come stay with us for a few days or so, you know something or while Jennifer was away in Thailand obviously you know like you can't really ring someone uh so she got bombarded with emails from Shane it is also said that he had been trying to uh, access her Facebook so she had to change her passwords and stuff and apparently in his emails Shane said that he was on a round the world trip Jennifer rang home and was told that Shane had actually went to Thailand so obviously she's a bit freaked out at this stage but by this point she has now moved on so she is in Laos, La Laos, Laos. So as I said Shane was supposed to go to Calcutta on a trip with Suez like a charity. Now 
this took like months of fundraising it took loads of training and stuff like that it was it was not just like willy-nilly no one can just decide to go do it suez have to decide who they want to pick to go you know so there was a lot involved and he cancelled he basically said he said you know for personal reasons he couldn't go so his you know so he was quite heartbroken you know talking to his mom and his dad and stuff he was quite heartbroken he said you know that he couldn't you know that he was devastated about jennifer and they suggested uh you know that he goes you know that he go on a holiday then you know to try clear his head keep his mind busy and not to just moping around now different sources make it sound like Shane decided to go to Thailand you know that he decided because he has a cousin in Thailand so some sources make it seem like he chose to go to Thailand and then he was supposed to go on to Australia after two weeks whereas some sources say that it was his parents who suggested because he had a cousin in Thailand that he should go to Thailand and then you know on to Australia and stuff like that so I'm not really sure so I suppose depending on your perspective of this story, you will decide whether you think he purposely went out to Thailand to try find Jennifer or if it coincidentally, you know, he was told like, why don't you go there? Because, you know, Bob is over there and at least you won't be on your own and this type of thing. So he went and uh, his father was quite worried about him. So apparently he, you know, would ring and check with the his nephew like that he was OK and the, the nephew Shane's cousin had said you know that he was quite down and stuff when he got there but that you know by you know after a couple of days then he seemed to kind of start cheering up and he was enjoying himself a little bit but after two weeks in Thailand he um cancelled he didn't go on to Australia he came home now it is said that at this point Shane started writing like letters to Jennifer he wasn't posting them or anything but he was just writing notes and letters to her and one source says that he wrote one on the plane to Thailand and in it he said that they would walk hand in hand in heaven. When Jennifer returned at the start of July, she actually didn't go home. She headed off to Galway, I don't know, maybe family or friends or something, but she just didn't want to come back to Dalkey and Kalini yet because she just didn't want to have to deal with Shane, I think. Uh, Seb, at this point, is actually, he went on a trip as well. As college kids do, he went on a trip to Spain and then on to Morocco with some friends. Also, it is said like that him and Jennifer, had, you know, at this point had kind of said like, again, like, you know, they were very much like, oh, let's see how things go with us and stuff. So they were very much like, you're going to do your thing and I'm going to do my thing during the summer. And like, we'll just see at the end of the summer what the crack is like if we want to, if we're still seeing each other or whatever. So even in contrast, it just seems like, the relationship is very different like it's very much just like oh let's see how we go you know whatever a lot more casual whereas Jennifer and Shane were quite uh planned out it was quite you know and I suppose like they had if they had spoke about marriage and stuff like that you know they were obviously a bit more serious than let's say Jennifer and Seb um but obviously it just got to the point then obviously Jennifer wasn't that wasn't what Jennifer wanted at this point Shane is home and he is still you know not getting he's not getting any better he's still you know heartbroken and depressed and so he says to his mom that he just he can't get over it he can't stop thinking about it he can't get over the depression so his mother takes him to the doctor and uh, the doctor says that he should take a week to exercise and eat better and stuff and see how that makes him feel and then some sources say that after a week he goes back and then some say that after three days he goes back but again, he goes back with his mother and he is prescribed citalopram at 20 milligrams. So on the 31st of July, after taking the medication for a couple of days, he rang the doctors and left a voicemail saying that he his uh, tongue was very swollen, which is apparently a side effect from this medication. Uh, left a message. No one got back to him, apparently. On August 3rd, he wrote on his own Facebook that he felt like he was getting the flu. Again, apparently there are symptoms. And on the 5th, obviously still feeling crap, you know, everything like, you know, if if you're still feeling depressed anyway, and if the medication hasn't, let's say, started working or you're getting very harsh side effects, he uh, took the remainder three weeks of his month's uh, prescription in a suicide attempt. Apparently, he slept for 24 hours. And then after this, he told his mother what he had done. So she took him back to the doctors to to the same clinic but to a different doctor and 
he was prescribed them again, but at a lower dose of 10 milligrams. It seems that his mother was quite surprised, you know, that he was given this medication again. But the medication probably hasn't started working. Like, if the doctor thinks that that's the best one for him, it might not have started working yet. So they might be kind of like, you know, he needs to take that one. Irrelevant of his suicide attempt. I don't know. When Jennifer arrived back in Dalkey, she arranged to meet one of her friends at the Ivory Bar. Um, and when she arrived, Shane was there waiting for her. And apparently he came up and, you know, said, I'll be outside if you want to talk. The following day, Jennifer unfriended Shane on Facebook. On the 15th of August, uh, Jennifer and her brother were down in the Glen of the Downs pub in Wicklow. Uh, their father, Jimmy, worked there. And Shane apparently uh, came in. And so Jimmy like could see him coming in and warned Jennifer. So she went into the bathroom. Now, it is, like this is obviously Wicklow. So his, his mother lives in Wicklow. So you could just say that he happened to be going there. Like I'm trying to just see it from both perspectives. You could say like maybe he was just going in anyway. But maybe he was chancing his arm that she was going to be there because that's where her dad worked. Or maybe his purpose was to go see her dad. I don't know. But Jennifer apparently stayed in the bathroom for an hour and a half while Jimmy spoke to Shane. And Jimmy, you know, was trying to tell him, like, you need to you need to move on, you know, all this. And it is said that during the conversation, Shane said that he was put on this planet to be with Jennifer and that she was never going to find anybody who loves her as much as he did. Like, maybe he thought, you know, like, this was kind of like a romantic thing, like, go speak to her dad or something, but... You know, it's nothing to do with her dad, it's her. So, the following day, on Sunday, the 16th of August, Seb was back at this stage from uh, his trip. And he made plans to go out with his friends. Jennifer made plans to go out with her friends. And they made loose plans then to meet up at the end of the night. And Jennifer was going to stay in Seb's in Bray. So, Seb uh, met some friends and they went to the Eagle House pub in Glastool and Seb was surprised that when he went in Shane Clancy was there with a mutual friend of theirs so he actually texted Jennifer to let her know that Shane was there so I don't know if maybe she was planning to meet him there later or what the story was or she was, he was just telling her that he was there whether this was by chance or by plan or whatever they ended up being in the same social circle so they were drinking well they were together Shane doesn't drink so they were socializing together after being there a couple of hours, they then went on to uh, the Queen's Bar in Dalkey. And they were there for a while. And then Queen's Bar actually has a nightclub upstairs called the Vico. So they went up to the nightclub. Now it is said that Shane was quiet. He wasn't really, you know, doing much. But that at the end of the night, he became quite energetic. And um, that he actually suggested that he would drop Seb and his two friends, uh, his two friends are twins, that he dropped them home to Bray. Now, uh, I know the area, I know the pubs that we're talking about. The Queen's Bar is like, like literally around a corner from the club bar, which is where Shane lives. Now, I'm not sure that Seb or his friends would have known this. Now, if someone was offering to drive me now, it's only a half an hour there and back, so like 15 minutes each way. But if uh, if someone was offering to do that for me and I knew that they lived literally around the corner, I'd like, I'd like no. In normal circumstances, I'd be like, no, don't be, don't be silly. Like, go home. You literally live there. Like, just walk around the corner. But given the circumstances as well, it just seems very bizarre. And it is said that, you know, the lads were like, no, especially... Uh, Seb's friends were quite like no it's grand don't worry like we can get a taxi and that he, they were actually kind of a bit like like there was girls in the group so they were kind of like if you're concerned about people getting home offer to drop the girls home but Shane was kind of you know insistent and also Seb apparently was kind of happy that they would avoid a taxi like paying for a taxi so he was like yeah okay so the lads went to get Chipper and Shane went to get his car the lads would say that on the way then home uh, Shane was driving quite like erratically like he was hitting the curb and stuff like that and so Seb's friends actually suggested that they drop 
uh, Seb off first and then they can they can get dropped off. But Shane said no, that he dropped them and then them, whatever. Maybe it made some more sense. And so apparently when they actually got to their house, one of the one of the lads said, like, Seb, do you want to just stay here? You know? And he said no. He was like, I know it's grand, I want to go home. And so they went on and so that fella texted him. And it was like, are you feckin' serious? Like, like you should have just stayed here. Like, he's going to know where you live. And he, apparently they even said, like, don't get out of your own house, right? So they all obviously must have felt like he was acting strange or there was something to it. I don't know. Maybe, like, I don't know. Would you necessarily just think because your friend is now dating the girl that this other fella used to date? I don't think that that's enough to warrant that kind of worry. I feel like there had to have been some sort of strange behaviour or worrying behaviour or dangerous behaviour. But uh, Seb allowed him to drop him home and he even invited him in uh, for a cup of tea you know like he said thanks and was like do you want to come in for a cup of tea uh seb's parents were actually away in the uk at the time so the only people there were seb shane and then seb's brother was actually in bed with his girlfriend i don't know how long he was actually there for and i'm sure that is a mystery of what was said between them if anything in particular was said but from a text that shane sent to jennifer it seems that his behaviour had, you know, gotten stranger and that he asked, he asked Seb for like a knife or a scissors to fix his shoes or something and that this, this scared uh, Seb. So Seb asked him to leave and he did. In the meantime then, Jennifer gets a taxi to Seb's house in Coola Grove in Bray. Shane then drove to Dunstores in Cornell's Court. Dunstores is like a big... Uh, grocery and household store and the one in Cornell's Court is 24 hours. It was just after 4am. Shane then went to the kitchen section and picked out a block of knives and headed to the cashier. Apparently the knives only cost a fiver and he handed it over and left. Shortly after this while Jennifer and Seb were you know discussing the events and Shane. Jennifer got a text from Shane that said Jen, I did something stupid and now I'm going to die. Get Seb to help me. He then phoned her and started uh, talking like with in gasps and was saying like, that I'm, like, I'm so cold, I'm going to die. Get Seb to help me. And apparently he just kept saying this. She asked where he was and he said, where are you? And so she told him that she was getting into a taxi in town and he told her that he knew she was lying. So immediately she was like, are you in Bray, Shane? Like, are you outside? Seb then spotted Shane outside the house so he you know opened the door because at this point Shane is still saying like he needs Seb's help and so Seb opens the door and uh, went out and Jennifer stayed back while they you know trying to see what the story was uh, Shane started walking towards him uh, you know like limping uh, like nearly almost walking like an old man and by the time Seb realised that Shane wasn't hurt, it was too late. He screamed, what the fuck is that? Fuck, he has a knife. Run, Jen, run. Jennifer ran back into the sitting room and tried to uh, block the door. And she could hear Seb screams outside. Shane broke the door down and started punching and kicking Jennifer. In the meantime, Dylan, Seb's brother, upstairs with his girlfriend Laura, woke up. And when Dylan opened his door to to see what was going on by this point Seb had gone upstairs he had crawled upstairs and um into into his parents bedroom Dylan could hear Jennifer downstairs screaming so uh he went downstairs but Shane came out to him in the hallway Dylan didn't realize at first what was happening he thought he was just being like like thumped in the side and it was only you know then he looked down and he realized he was being stabbed and that this fella he de- he didn't even know was trying to kill him so he he was trying to look around and he saw his keys on like the, the hall table and there was a pen knife on them so he he grabbed them and was able to open it with his teeth and uh stuck the knife up to shane's eye and said like if you don't get away from me now i'm gonna blind you so shane retreated um dylan ran back upstairs and he uh locked himself and his girlfriend into their bedroom it must be so horrific like he knew he he like Seb was dying he was probably dead at this stage already Shane returned to the sitting room 
and again started uh, hitting Jennifer. He punched her and she said she was lucky whatever way she like fell onto the couch because her back turned to him and at that moment he, he stabbed her and so the knife went through uh, in between her shoulders and the handle broke off. So at this point Shane retreated again. I don't, um, I kind of reckon that he went to get another knife and Jennifer grabbed her phone and ran out the back into the back garden and um, she actually climbed over a wall. At this point, uh, she had rang her dad and was screaming like, I've been stabbed. Now, I don't know why the first person you wouldn't ring would be the guards or an ambulance. Um, but apparently she rang her dad and was screaming like, I've been stabbed. And so a neighbour in the next garden actually like woke up obviously and like because he could hear screaming and so he looked down and uh like there's a girl on top of his shed and so he went out got her brought her in and while his wife like rang uh for an ambulance and guards and stuff and was trying to you know console uh jennifer this fella actually bravely then went in to the house um so he went in and he was calling for uh sebastian and so he went upstairs and, and found Sebastian slumped against the bedroom door. He like all the colour was gone from him. He was he was gone. Uh John, the neighbour, however, had first aid training, so started CPR on him. And when until the until the paramedics arrived, and when the paramedics arrived, uh it is said that like he was walking back down and when the he heard one of the paramedics say, like, this man is dead. So Gardie arrived. Um, but at this point Shane is not there his car is still outside but Shane is nowhere to be seen Dylan was stabbed nine times and uh, one of his lungs was actually punctured but before they were rushed to hospital him and Jennifer were able to give like an outline a description of like what had happened um, it, Dylan's girlfriend as well Laura hadn't really seen anything because she was in the bedroom and she was she was still in shock so they were rushed off and um, Gardy then had to send two different teams to Shane's parents, his mother and his father. The guardie um, would tell both parents that Shane's car had been found outside the home where a young man had been stabbed to death. His father, Patrick, you know, said that he thought immediately that if his son had anything to do with this, that his son would be no longer alive because he wouldn't be able to live with what he'd done. His mother, uh, you know, obviously distraught and in denial, said like there must have been a mistake that Shane's, Shane's car must have been stolen for it to be there. Sebastian's parents who were in the UK uh, had to be phoned and told that one of their sons uh, had died and one of them was you know like critically injured in hospital so they made immediate, uh, immediate plans to come home. The house had been sealed off and forensics were going through Um, Shane was still nowhere, you know, there was basically a manhunt on to find Shane. And forensics were going through the garden where Jennifer had escaped. And down at the end, in some shrubbery, they found the body of Shane Clancy. It's believed that he had, you know, gone out into the garden to find Jennifer and she wasn't there. And Shane then tried to kill himself by stabbing himself 19 times. And I would, I imagine that from the adrenaline and from everything, none of them were, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't dying. And so he um, wedged the knife into the ground and then uh, got on his knees and measured the distance, put his hands behind his back and fell onto the knife. Both Sebastian and Shane died from knife wounds to the heart. An investigation into, you know, the the events the night before and stuff had begun and they were talking to the people that had been in the company of both men. They searched Shane's bedsit and in it they found eight letters addressed to Jennifer neatly placed on the mantelpiece. It said that the content was quite disturbing and showed how much the obsession had grown. There was also a letter to his mother in which he apologised for what he had to do. One of the letters dates back as far as May. The shock, uh, you know, that this brought to the community and also just to Ireland in general. The, you know, how someone who was so kind and compassionate and, you know, charitable and fun and all this could 
could commit such an awful horrific act. But obviously the case was being discussed, you know, on, on radio and TV and everything and in the papers. And I feel like a lot of people who would have been close to Shane, you know, friends and stuff, then had to choose whether they were still identifying as a friend of this person because of the horrific act that they'd done. Um, like apparently during a radio interview with Liveline, you know, people came on to speak how great about how great, you know, Seb was. And a friend of Shane's rang in and like didn't want to didn't want to give his name, you know, but was saying like that, you know, he was he had been a great friend and you know, that they were all, sh you know, shocked because for something to happen like this, the funeral of the two men took place, but, you know, they would have, they would have had very different atmospheres around them. Tributes, you know, came pouring in for uh, Sebastian. At the inquest into um, Shane's death and Sebastian's death, it was shown that Shane had uh, toxic to fatal levels of the antidepressant in his system. He had 3.1 milligrams, which was apparently 15 times the upper therapeutic dose. The deputy state pathologist, Declan Gilsenin, um, who had performed the postmortems, said that the drug um, suggested, there was a theory that suggested that there may be a danger period at the start of the treatment before it lifts the depression, that it will uh, change like a, a person's ability to make decisions. Professor David Healy of Cardiff University he said that the drug was known to cause uh, suicidal and homicidal tendencies. Now, the Irish Society of Psychiatrists apparently wasn't allowed to, to speak at the inquest because they would have said the opposite. Apparently, they would have said that it, it you know, it isn't pro uh, proven. There is no evidence to show this. And they said that it was it was harmful to say things like this because it added to the stigma of people taking antidepressants. Shane's mother is, um, you know, adamant that the the antidepressants are what caused her son to do what he did you know for the majority of his life he he was a, a nice kind you know good-hearted person the inquest actually um returned an open verdict on shane's death meaning they didn't rule it as a suicide because uh for it to be ruled as a suicide there has to have been intention beforehand and apparently they they couldn't determine that that is what he intended to do at you know at the beginning of all this that he intended to, to kill himself Shane was taking the antidepressant for two weeks um up and you know up to the night that this all happened but like I have to think that he started to like his behavior had changed before he was taking the medication the medication may have affected you know his ability to make such a like drastic awful decision but his behavior had definitely changed before then you know it was clear from statements that um you know his obsession had grown the letters obviously showed that he was doing that and that was back in may one source says that a family friend of the hannigans did say that uh they had reported twice the, the shane stalking basically because i suppose you would kind of ask that question like why didn't you you know if he was acting the way he was why didn't you do something so there is one source now in the same source uh, from a newspaper a guard a source in that also says that there wasn't any um you know incidents or reports of stalking before this so obviously they're conflicting and it's just a bit bizarre i think that you know like to just to be able to just go into a supermarket at four in the morning and pick up a block of knives like who is doing that at that time like like i read something about um you know oh like well, you know you could have been a chef you know picking up what chef is picking up knives at four in the morning? Like, no one needs to be buying knives at four in the morning. Now, I think things like that have gotten a bit stricter since then. I'm not even sure if that Duns is actually still a 24 hours uh, hour Duns or not. Whether the drugs are behind what happened or if this was always going to happen. I kind of wonder, was there something, you know, was there some sort of mental, you know, disorder or whatever there? Because they do say that some mental disorders um, in, in men only kind of come out in their like late teens, early 20s anyway. And so I wonder if this is, you know, if the breakup kind of just exasper exasperated, exasperate, exacerbated. Perhaps the breakup just made the, you know, his, his mental state worse. 
because like we've all been there we've all been broken hearted and and felt rejected and felt like the world was going to end and we would never love again and the majority of people get over it and they move on and they find someone else and they live very happy healthy lives so i don't think the i don't think the the breakup was enough now also there's never been any mention of like previous girlfriends of Shane so perhaps this was his first girlfriend so this was his first love so obviously that's even more intense you know the love will be more intense the breakup will be more intense the heartbreak will be more intense but I just don't think that the breakup that this was enough I feel like there was there was something else there before maybe like I could be I could be completely off the mark but uh schizophrenia shows up in early to mid 20s in men and I know like part of that can be like a, a one of the symptoms can be like a delusion kind of you know about things about like a perceived reality and stuff so maybe the fact that he you know really believed that him and Jennifer should be together maybe this is why like a normal breakup didn't happen that he he kept thinking like no no like we're supposed to be together you know I'm the only one who can love her kind of thing and perhaps this is what happened and it just all came together and then again the drugs the antidepressant probably didn't help because it probably didn't cloud his judgment at that time and I feel like it was just a combination of all these things I could be completely wrong I think it's clear though like it wasn't a snap decision like I think Shane had planned that day you know even the, like the letters laid up the letter to his mother you know I don't think by chance he met Sebastian that night and then ended up hanging out with him and then ended up you know casually bringing him home and then that something just snapped and he came back I do feel like it was planned and perhaps like perhaps when he was asking for the knife or the scissors that was the intention or maybe he was just genuinely asking for it to fix his shoe maybe that was the intention but I kind of feel like if you were going to do it there and then like that why wouldn't you have just done it like like he could have easily just like he could have easily just overpowered Sebastian and then got into the knives or something if that was what he wanted to do so I don't know but I feel like he knew what he was doing even the fact like he drove you know he drove from Bray to Cornell's Court went in and bought them and then drove back so that was a bit of time he had to think in his head don't do this like no like calm down don't do this and it didn't so it was still there so I don't think it was a rash decision like you hear of stories where like even like you hear friends at parties and stuff you know like with drink and drugs or whatever and something happens an argument happens and someone just happens to grab a knife in the kitchen or whatever and stab someone I don't think it was a case like that because there was all this time in between where he left he went and bought the knives and he went back I don't think it was this snap decision of something that happened I think it was a longer plan but the thing is no matter what we are you know no matter what speculations you want to put on in where the blame is going to be placed the fact is that that night three families lives changed forever you know two men are now gone Jennifer will have to live with what happened you know her family will have to live with what happened Sebastian's family and you know his brother Dylan and her uh, Laura will have to deal with what they dealt with and then Shane's family will have to deal with it because no matter where you want to place the blame or you know whatever Shane's parents still lost a child and his younger siblings still have to now grow up without their brother and what's worse is because of how he died and because of what he'd done there'll always be that kind of like I don't want to say blame or whatever but it'll always be that kind of cloud there won't there like it won't like he didn't he didn't die by the hands of someone else you know he took someone else's life and then he took his own and so like honestly that's who I feel that's who I feel for the most is is Shane's younger siblings but obviously the, the three families lives are changed and and that's it and no Leone is you know campaigning for there to be more um kind of I think like regulation and information out there on antidepressants she isn't by no means trying to like stop antidepressants because obviously they help a lot of people but I think she just wants it to be more clear now I have heard of other you know I have heard of antidepressants that have you know caused people to harm harm people or harm themselves or kill themselves there was actually a case um from 
from where I'm from, where uh, I think uh, a poor boy, I think he was only about 14, and he was taking a medication, and he actually ended up uh, shooting himself. Um, you know, and, and they put it down to, it was this medication that he was taking, you know, because especially because for children, like, it's so much more intense, isn't it? Um, and as far as I know, like, his parents, you know, his parents sued, sued the uh, pharmaceutical company because the warnings, like, the data was there, but the warnings weren't there to show that, like, children shouldn't be taking it or that these things, you know, can give homicidal or suicidal tendencies. I don't mean to point any type of blame when I say this or, you know, I just wonder, because, like, my mind just has a million questions all the time about everything. But I wonder why Shane's mother or father didn't kind of insist that he go stay with them for a while. You know, when he was starting to really show this depression. Even especially, like, if he had, you know, taken a suicide attempt. I don't know, I feel, like, again, like, because I think he was quite young to be living on his own. And then, especially if all these problems were going on, you know, if he had, could things have been different if he had more supervision? I don't know. But again, like, obviously, he's an adult. He's 22 at this stage. You can't force him, you know, you can't force him to, to stay, stay at your house, like can't force him not to go out on a night out so yeah this was the uh you know sad story of heartbreak gone wrong gone too far um and you know two people losing their lives and many people's lives now altered forever thank you for uh listening and watching and hopefully we will see you in the next video thanks